Welcome to the Rare Books Department. The philosophy behind the Rare Books Department has long emphasized the importance of the book as a physical object. Some of the most meaningful interactions with the Rare Books collection have occurred in the classroom, where students are able to hold history in their hands. We would now like to extend our reach in order to remain committed to providing reference, research, and educational access by offering new online options for students, faculty, and community members alike. We welcome you to subscribe to the official Rare Books blog, Open Book, and browse our digital exhibitions. Click on the links for more info and enjoy. There is a word that describes a person who loves to read, admire, and collect books. That word is bibliophile, and bibliophiles have existed since antiquity. In the ancient world, papyrus scrolls and early codices were collected by both institutions and individuals. Some books were treasured because of their illustrations and art. Others were treasured for their gold and jewels, while some books were worshipped because their words had come directly from God. Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy, was one such bibliophile. It is said at the height of his reign he possessed about 600 manuscripts, the largest private collection of his day. He was such a lover of books, particularly the good book, he commissioned a special altar book to be made so that he could take it with him on his travels. The cover of this book is made of two thick panels of wood bound together by the hinges. The panels open to reveal two paintings. The one on the left depicts the Trinity, with God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the crucified Christ. On the opposite side is a representation of the coronation of the Virgin. Below, a little book is attached, in which Philip the Good can be found in eternal prayer. Although early manuscripts were not placed on the retail market, their worth was valuable enough to be used as collateral for loans of money, and even valuable enough to steal. Even when the printing press allowed for the production of multiple copies, book collectors could revel in knowing that they possessed within their collections a first edition or limited edition book hot off the press. While modern technology might promote planned obsolescence, the magic of books continues to be accessible to us hundreds and sometimes thousands of years later. It is no wonder that books hold on to their value for so long. For those very special books, there is a very special place in the J. Willard Marriott Library. The Rare Books Department of the Marriott Library is one of five departments within the Special Collections Division. Other departments include manuscripts, photo archives, audio and visual, and print and journal. Special Collections materials are held on the fourth floor of the Marriott Library and can be accessed by request in the Special Collections Reading and Reference Room. The history of Rare Books Collection can be traced back to the early years of the University of Deseret and its first president, John R. Park. When President Park died in 1900, his entire library of some 3,400 volumes was given to the university. Park's library had been one of the most significant book collections ever assembled by an individual in the history of the state of Utah. The Rare Books Collection Corps was initially made up of books from the Utah Territorial Library, the University of Deseret Library, and the John R. Park Private Book Collection. Over the years, other individual library collections were acquired. As the collection consisted mainly of books on Utah and the Mormons, these collections were put together and set aside in a special room called the Utah Room. Other gifts and donation came in gradually, and by 1965, the rare collection numbered almost 30,000 bound volumes. Thanks to university funding and generous gifts, the rare books collection has continued to grow over the last 55 years. Today, the Rare Books Department holds more than 80,000 items in the collection, ranging from Sumerian clay tablets to 21st century artist books, and almost everything in between. You might be wondering now, what makes a book rare? While there can be a lot of criteria which determine the value of a book, some of the most important qualities we look at are age, scarcity, print history and provenance, in addition to historic, cultural, and aesthetic values. Let's take a look at a few examples. Not all old books are rare books, but the age of a book can be an important factor. 
The oldest books in our collection are defined as manuscripts, meaning written by hand. This manuscript is an Arabic translation from a Greek or Coptic original of writings of St. Basil and St. Gregory. Although the manuscript is undated, the motifs and painting style are typical of Egyptian illumination found in the early 15th century. Unlike handwritten books, printed books are typically not one of a kind, although early printed books can hold just as much value. For instance, books printed within the first 50 years of the printing press are considered to be very rare. We call these incunables. Over time, and with the introduction of mass market publications in the early 19th century, books began to lose their commercial value. But before you start judging a book by its cover, there are a few other things to examine. How rare is a rare book exactly? Determining the scarcity of a book might be as simple as turning to the colophon, the statement at the end of the book which provides information about its authorship and printing. The colophon might know exactly how many editions were printed. If a book is printed in a limited edition run, or under 500 copies, then that book is surely rare. Not all books, however, provide colophons. In this case, book collectors and dealers track the circulation of titles to figure out approximately how many books were published. Some books, like this collection of plants, become books by accident, making them one of a kind and extremely rare. This book contains no bibliographic information, other than a handwritten note on the first page which describes the book as the collection of plants found in the Arctic sections made by Captain Hockner, second in command of HMS Fury. The Fury and the Hecla sailed to discover the Northwest Passage, May 1821. Attached to an end page, there is also a miniature envelope that holds moss, which Franklin and his party had as their only food. It is possible that this note alludes to the failed overland expeditions in the Arctic led by Sir John Franklin between 1819 and 1822. During this time, Franklin lost more than half of the men in his party to starvation and, in order to survive, the remainder of his crew ate lichen, with some attempting to eat their own leather boots. Furthermore, there were rumors of cannibalism, and at least one murder reported. In addition to the handwritten notes, a book plate on the first page suggests that sometime during the mid-20th century, the book was held in the Department of Botany in Oxford, while Nicholas Palunin was the keeper of the herbaria, which is now almost 400 years old. While lecturing at Oxford, Palunin traveled to the Canadian Arctic as a botanist on an expedition that discovered the last major islands to be added to the world's map. To add to its scarcity, this book contains a unique provenance, or record of ownership, making it all the more valuable. In addition to age and provenance, the author, and even the publisher, can be equally significant. A reader can look to a book's imprint to learn more about the publisher and publishing history. An imprint is something like a brand, and some imprints hold a lot more prestige than others. Publisher Erhard Rotteld is a perfect example. Rotteld's reputation largely rests upon his edition of Euclid's Elements of Geometry. Printed in 1482, Elements was the first printed book to contain geometrical figures. In his dedication to this edition, Rotteld suggested that the scarcity of printed mathematical works was due to the problems involved in printing the geometrical diagrams. He then happily announced that he had discovered a method of printing them just as easily as the text. He did not elaborate upon this method, choosing to keep it secret. The page layout, particularly the first page, is an outstanding example of Rotschild's consideration of the overall look and readability of his work. The first page also includes an elegant, three-sided woodblock and a white vine-style woodcut initial. Plus, several hundred small ornamental capitals are throughout the book, and more than 420 carefully designed and perfectly printed marginal diagrams confirm its standing as a landmark publication. While a book's publishing history holds a lot of value in the world of rare books, history itself is often an underlying factor when determining how rare a book is. Historic value considers and contextualizes the historic moment during which the book was published, 
and how the circumstances of that moment might influence the actions of author and publisher. Thomas Paine's Common Sense, for example, called for the separation of the colonies from Great Britain in a persuasive argument for independence that was printed in a small, inexpensive pamphlet. Yet this very pamphlet, which was printed in the hundreds of thousands, moved mass public opinion toward the cause of the American Revolution, arguably changing the course of history as we know it. Common Sense was a bestseller immediately upon publication. It was first printed in Philadelphia by Robert Bell on January 9, 1776, in an edition of 1,000 copies. That first printing was read by everyone in the Continental Congress and nearly everyone in the colonies who were literate. Then, those who could read read aloud to nearly everyone who could not. Within a month, two more editions were published, with an additional 150,000 copies in circulation. Payne refused to copyright the work and gave permission to all to reprint it. What happened next was legendary. 25 editions were published in 13 cities in the year 1776, reaching nearly half a million copies printed in that year alone. This is impressive, considering that at the time, the colonial population was about 3 million people, a number which included slaves, women, and children. Like historic value, cultural value considers and contextualizes only this time focusing on the dynamics of culture during the time of publication. It looks at how emerging cultural movements, whether belonging to or going against the status quo, might influence the written word. Here we find some of the most unassuming rare books, like this literary journal called Anvil from the early 20th century. Anvil's editor, Jack Conroy, was born to Irish immigrants in a coal mining camp outside of Moberly, Missouri. As a young man, he joined up with a group of proletariat writers, loosely connected with the industrial workers of the world. Unlike many of the other writers who came from an educated background, Conroy understood that the proletariat were more sensitive to the enticements of mass culture and consumerism than slogans such as, Workers Unite. As such, he wanted a publication molded from the experiences of young writers from the mills, mines, forests, factories, and offices of America a publication that portrayed an honest, rather than simplistic, view of the working-class experience. With all this in mind, the Anvil was born in 1933. The title Anvil evoked the worker's world, strength, firmness, raw material, the force of physical labor, the shaping of a new world. These images also complemented the magazine's slogan, We prefer crude vigor to polished banality. The first issue of Banville was printed in a run of 1,000. 200 copies were exchanged with other magazines, and the rest were sold at 10 cents each. Although Anvil was a short-lived literary experiment, the existence of this journal retains a cultural memory, like a time capsule providing insight to a time that was. Sometimes a book has value simply because it is a beautiful book. Aesthetic value looks at the craftsmanship of bookmaking and gives special attention to the skills of binding, papermaking, and letterpress printing. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as they say, but for a long while, the practice of bookmaking centered around profit rather than art. Like many trades, bookmaking was impacted by the Industrial Revolution, particularly with regards to how we make paper. The first machine to make a continuous sheet of paper was patented in 1798 in France. Patents for the papermaking machine in England soon followed. With this invention, paper would no longer have to be hand-pulled, but can now be made by the roll. And this, along with the introduction of wood pulp, impacted the quality of paper, and therefore the quality of the book. From this point forward, books became fairly inexpensive to make. Paperbacks and chapbooks targeted toward lower-class readers entered circulation, and since more people could now afford books, more people were learning how to read. While literacy rates were increasing, the quality of the book was beginning to suffer. Cheap paper and production shortened the life of the book tremendously. In reaction to the decline in standards associated with industrialized production, the arts and crafts movement was born in mid-century Britain. As part of that movement, Artist and designer William Morris was eager to revive the craft of printmaking. Inspired by the medieval manuscripts of the past, 
Morris founded the Kelmscott Press in 1891 in order to publish limited edition illuminated style books. One of the books that was printed was the Epic of Beowulf. The Epic of Beowulf is a Norse legend and one of the earliest examples of Old English in particular and Germanic literature in general. It is a unique source for information on the early history of peoples in northern Germany and Scandinavia. The Kelmscott edition was translated by William Morris and A.J. Wyatt. Morris designed the woodcuts that flourished the title page, along with designing numerous smaller page borders and initials. The text was printed in Troy and Chaucer types, in red and black ink. The Epic of Beowulf was printed in an edition of only 300 copies, and is certainly one of the most typographically beautiful editions ever published. So now that we know a little bit more about what makes a book rare, you might find yourself wondering how the Marriott Library acquires such materials. While some of the books have been inherited into the collection, as I mentioned before, many, many others have been acquired over time. These acquisitions include books that were purchased, donated, and reclassed. A special budget set aside for rare books acquisitions has allowed us to purchase a variety of titles. In an effort to expand our collection to meet the needs of faculty, students, and community members, we look for books that we believe will make an impact on research and education. This book, for example, was purchased to increase the scope of women's influence in medieval literature. Furthermore, it allowed one particular student a chance to study a book that would otherwise be impossible to view in real life. This is a facsimile edition of the first theological work by St. Hildegard of Bingen. Hildegard was a German Benedictine abbess, writer, composer, philosopher, Christian mystic, visionary, and polymath. At an early age, she began having visions, which led her to be sent off to a monastery for the rest of her life. Hildegard did not begin writing down her visions until she was 42 years old. Then, over the course of 10 years, she produced this book, Liber Sivius. The manuscript, considered to be a guide, takes into consideration the concepts of the universe. Inspired by her visions, the manuscript features 35 fantastic illuminations, which make Liber Sivius one of the most lavish and decorated medieval manuscripts of all time. While we are so lucky to be able to purchase rare books, we are even luckier to receive kind donations from people both near and far, anonymous and named. One recent donation was a set of issues of a newspaper titled The Friend. The donated set spans a course of 76 years, beginning with an issue from 1870 and ending with an issue from 1946. The very first issue of The Friend was published in January 1842, originally under the name Temperance Advocate. The newspaper began as a monthly periodical for seamen and included news from both American and English newspapers. Gradually, the monthly expanded to feature announcements, advertisements, reprints of sermons, poetry, local news, editorials, arrivals and departures, marriages and obituaries. The paper was published by the Reverend Samuel Chinary Damon, who was sent by the American Seamen's Friend Society to be the chaplain in Honolulu. He was the pastor of the Bethel Union Church, Seaman's Chapel, for 42 years, and the editor of The Friend from 1843 until his death in 1885. Under Reverend Damon, nearly one million copies of the newspaper were distributed. In addition to purchases and donations, some rare books are found within the library's general collection. Dependent on the criteria of what makes a book rare, some books might be reclassed from the general collection to the rare books collection, adding to our growing number of titles. One such book was reclassed because of its historic and cultural value. The publication of Metropol was the result of a number of drastic changes in the Soviet Union, beginning first with the death of Stalin, which temporarily eased publishing restrictions within the literary world. But by the end of the 1960s and under the leadership of Leonid Brezhnev, Writers and artists alike were required to conform to the framework of socialist realism, a rigid aesthetic that aimed at the ideological transformation and education of workers in the spirit of socialism. The Soviet Union did not exactly censor its writers. In fact, censorship did not even officially exist in the Soviet Union at this time, 
for in practice, everything that was to be published, broadcast, or filmed went through rigorous screening by the party's officials. Such was the environment that created the Metropol Affair of 1979, known as the Soviet Union's last great literary scandal. Metropol included the works of 23 writers, including American novelist John Updike, who contributed to the bulky almanac that numbered 760 pages. The purpose of Metropol was to open literature within the Soviet Union to a wider range of aesthetic approaches, to create a space in which authors did not have to choose between being Soviet or anti-Soviet, in which they were free to say exactly what they wished. In short, they simply wanted to see their work in print. In order to bypass official publishing protocol, 12 homemade copies of the almanac were printed. Though large and bulky, two copies were smuggled out of the country, with one copy landing on Karl Proffer's desk at the Artist Press in Michigan. When artists published Metropol, it released a facsimile copy so that the importance of the work as a material object, as opposed to simply being literature, was highlighted. For a foreign reader who had no familiarity with Russian, the material qualities of the almanac, along with the knowledge of the scandal it had provoked, probably held more significance than the content of the stories and poems included inside. So far, I've just given you a small preview of what the Rare Books collection holds. With more than 80,000 items in the collection, we can almost guarantee that we have something for everyone. Although we continue to build on our collection in order to fill in the gaps, there are a number of collection strengths that I'd like to share with you. The first is the Middle East collection. One of the top 10 Middle East libraries in North America, the Aziz S. Atiyah Middle East Library is internationally recognized as a major center of research in Middle Eastern studies. The Middle East Center and the Middle East Library were first established at the University of Utah in 1959, with the appointment of just one faculty member. In 1961, the department finally became official, with a small budget of $5,000 for library acquisitions. The Middle East Library has since been incorporated into the Rare Books Department. One of the highlights of the Middle East Library is the Arabic Papyrus, Parchment, and Paper Collection. This collection is the largest of its kind in the United States, containing 770 Arabic Papyrus documents, 1,300 Arabic Paper documents, and several pieces on parchment. The collection includes a significant number of documents from the pre-Ottoman period and thus offers a unique source material on the political, economic, religious, and intellectual life of Egypt during the first two centuries of Islamic rule and the period leading up to the Ottoman domination. Although we always say there's nothing like holding the real thing in your hands, sometimes the real thing is simply inaccessible. In the case of medieval manuscripts, there is usually just one copy of the real thing. In order to share this one copy, meticulous reproductions that convey the spirit and power of the book have been made. We call these reproductions facsimiles. The word facsimile comes from the Latin, meaning to make the same, and oftentimes it is so close to the original it's hard to tell the difference. Each book is approached individually in order to successfully duplicate the format, tone, and color unique to each work. The actual condition of the original book is respected. Water damage, tears, discoloration, uneven pages, etc. are recreated without changing, adding to, or enhancing the condition of the book in any way. No cost can be spared to achieve an exact replica. Bindings are handcrafted to faithfully duplicate things such as the original type of leather or fabric used, as well as any clasps, fasteners, gilding, and embossing. Because facsimile production is such a painstaking process, Editions are necessarily expensive and limited. The Marriott Library is among the few libraries in the world to own so many of these beautiful books. This is a facsimile copy of a 14th century Nawa manuscript. This reference book, used by a priest or a fortune teller, defines various periods of the calendar with their meanings and variations, with several sections discussing mythological and ceremonial meanings. The original codex resides in the Vatican Library, where it has been since the 16th century. The codex is structured as an accordion fold, or continuous strip, made of 10 attached sheets of deerskin, covered on both sides with stucco. It was arranged as a screen fold with a wooden cover at either end. 
The original cover showed traces of ornamental turquoise design, but only a single piece of the gemstone remains. The painter of the manuscript arranged his material in such a way that by adjusting the length of each section, all pages are completely filled. Although the page size is small, the whole document is one of the most extensive Mesoamerican manuscripts, and we are incredibly lucky to have a facsimile such as this in our collection. But the Rare Books collection has more than just fancy reproductions. Most of our books are, in fact, the real thing. How would you feel holding a first edition copy of Galileo's Dialogues? What about a signed copy of Charles Darwin's Origin of Species? The Marriott Library has first edition of both these works and first editions of books by other pioneers of science, such as William Gilbert, Johannes Kepler, Antoine Lavoisier, Carl Gauss, Charles Lyell, Michael Faraday, Louis Pasteur, Marie Curie, and many more. Chronicling the history of science, books such as these give us insight into the communication, conversation, collaboration, and controversy that made scientific discovery possible, a revolution that has been going on in print for more than 500 years. Each of these books has its own story to tell. One of the most interesting stories is that of Isaac Newton's Principia. Although Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler had shown the way by describing the phenomenon they observed, Isaac Newton explained the underlying universal laws of those phenomena. Newton's theories overthrew the subjective interpretations of nature that had dominated science and the natural philosophy since the time of Aristotle, and ushered in the age of reason. By age 43, Newton had invented calculus, had broken white light into its component colors, and built a telescope whose design is still used today. When he was 47, he published the book that profoundly changed the way we see the world and established his brilliance as an astronomer and mathematician. It is likely that no more than 300 copies of this first edition were printed. Principia gave us the three laws of motion, defined gravity, and provided the precise mathematical equations by which it could be measured. Edmund Halley was instrumental in getting Percipia into print. Halley wheedled, flattered, and bullied Newton, a recluse, into preparing his manuscript. Halley even paid the cost of printing out of his own pocket. In the 21st century, Percipia is still considered to be one of the greatest single contributions in the history of science. From the history of science to the history of religion. The Rare Books collection holds some of the most notable religious works, including a first edition copy of the Book of Mormon signed by Joseph Smith, first printed editions of the Greek New Testament, and first and early editions by Martin Luther, among so many more. Like this book, published in 1691 and written by Vaclav Steyer. Steyer was a Czech Jesuit priest, preacher, translator, and linguist. With his mother, he founded a society whose purpose was to publish and distribute Catholic books in Czech. The word postile or postila is an abbreviated term for a marginal note or biblical commentary. Postiles were intended to provide clarification and spiritual instruction. Steyer's own postila was written during a very polarizing time in Bohemia, when Protestants were publicly persecuted and exiled. The Habsburg era from 1620 to the late 18th century was known as the Dark Age by the Czech people, as the nation suffered from a declining population, war, famine, and disease. The German Habsburgs prohibited not only religious freedom, but national liberty and identity, replacing the Czech language and culture with the German language and influence. Steyer's publication was an attempt to hold on to the cultural and linguistic values by printing the Catholic text in Czech. The survival of Postila demonstrates the power of the book. Now held in this rare books collection, this book was once owned by a Czech immigrant named Peter Simelka. Simelka fled to the United States with his family just one year after the Prague Spring erupted. They brought only their most valuable possessions, including this copy of Vaclav Steyer's Postila. The book was presented to former Utah governor Calvin Rampton as a tribute of gratitude for the support and friendship the Simelka family received during their first year in Utah. In an interview with the Salt Lake Tribune, Simelka was quoted to have said, 
Thousands of people have fled their country in order to save the most precious thing to each of us, liberty and human dignity, and of course, their books. Books certainly do travel far and wide, both literally and figuratively. Travel books, particularly focused on overland exploration and the American West, are considered to be another one of our collection's strengths. The western frontier, with its promise of wealth and adventure, inspired immigrants to trek hundreds of miles in search for a new life. Along with these immigrants, politicians, explorers, adventurers, and entrepreneurs set out to document their overland expeditions in print, making for some very interesting reading. Two of the most famous tales of westward exploration can be found in the Marriott Library's Rare Books collection. The first is that of Lewis and Clark. On the left, you'll see the title page from President Thomas Jefferson's message from the President of the United States. Jefferson's message is the cover letter for a group of documents that report government-funded explorations in the recently acquired territory known as the Louisiana Purchase. The explorations were led by Meriwether Lewis, Jefferson's private secretary and trained surveyor. Alongside Lewis was William Clark. Their journey opened the West to both exploration and exploitation, displacing the American Indian while giving the young American nation an unprecedented opportunity for expansion. On the right is Hastings' Immigrant's Guide to Corrigan in California. Lansford Warren Hastings was a young real estate entrepreneur from Ohio who had financial and political interest in California. After making a trip west in 1842, Hastings published his Immigrant's Guide, which quickly became a best-selling book. A copy of this bestseller was purchased by Jacob Donner of the now infamous Donner Reed Party. Donner's copy was found, much handled, in the saddlebag of one of the travelers. Unfortunately for the Donner Reed Party, Hastings' Immigrant's Guide gave some really, really bad advice. Eager to sell land in California, Hastings encouraged travelers to forget about Oregon, suggesting a cutoff through the Wasatch Mountains, passing to the south of the Great Salt Lake, and then across the Salt Flats to rejoin the California Trail at the Humboldt River. Hastings, who had not in fact traveled this route, was sure that the shortcut would save travels valuable time. As Virginia Reed, a survivor of the Donna Reed party, said in her advice to a relative traveling in a later year, Remember, never take no cutoffs and hurry along as fast as you can. On April 29, 1847, the nearly three-month-long rescue of the survivors of the Donna Reed Party ended. The last surviving member arrived at Sutter's Fort more than a year after the original party had departed from Springfield, Illinois. The rare books I've shown you thus far can provide a truly insightful look into history but rare books can also be used as a lens to view our own contemporary time. 21st century artist books and fine press books are also considered rare due to both their aesthetic value and their scarcity. A particularly unique strength in our collection, the rare book shelves are lucky to hold such a vast number of these books. While fine press books have already been defined as emphasizing bookmaking craftsmanship, artist books are significantly trickier to pin down. Artist books can vary in size and shape, often making us question what a book is and what a book can be. Artist books can also vary in topic and theme, sometimes telling personal stories, commenting on current events, or imagining a new future. Artist books can even reimagine classic literature with a new perspective, like the book you see on the left, titled Whitman Crosshatch. Book artist Barry McCallion reimagines Walt Whitman's words to reflect on mood and meaning. Excerpts of Whitman's text are woven through colorful pages, imitating a crosshatch. To the right, a different narrative is being retold. This one is about Spanish Lieutenant Cabeza de Vaca and his expedition in the Gulf of Mexico. The original story was written by Haniel Long in 1936. Sixty years later, Rob and Georgia Bukert of the Trist Press took the story to create a fine press masterpiece. The Trist Press was started by the Bukerts in the early 1990s. Since then, they have expanded from the basement of their Provo apartment. Rob now teaches letterpress classes at BYU 
using some of the same equipment he used as a student almost 30 years ago. He also teaches paper making out of the Tris Press Studio, where they now specialize in making fine letterpress announcements. From the Trist Press to the Marriott Library's very own Redview Press and Book Art Studio, the skills of bookmaking still draw intrigue from faculty, students, and community members. If you're looking for more resources, a variety of titles on the history of the book and the history of printing can be found within the Rare Books collection. One example of such a book is The History of Papermaking in the Philippines, created by Peter and Domina Thomas. This book was letterpress printed on Peter's handmade paper and handbound by Peter and Donna. It was printed in an edition of 75 copies, with Rare Books copy being number 7, signed by the authors. Peter and Donna Thomas are book artists from Santa Cruz, California. Since 1977, they have worked both collaboratively and individually. They work on letterpress printing, hand lettering and illustrating texts, making paper, and hand binding both fine press and artist books. Their initial aim was to create limited edition fine press books made of the finest materials and produced to the highest standards of quality in both full size and miniature format. This aesthetic continued to guide them through the 1990s as they worked in new formats made possible by personal computer technology, exploring non-traditional book structures and shaped book objects as both limited editions and one-of-a-kind books. Without a doubt, the rare books held at the J. Willard Marriott Library are special. And while a certain set of criteria might make a book rare, the true value of a book shouldn't be determined by a price tag. Books are important to our understanding of history, and to ensure that our history reflects all kinds of voices, we will continue to collect books and continue to tell their stories. Most importantly, we will continue to argue that there is nothing like holding the real thing in your hands. If you have any questions about the books in this presentation or about any of the books in our collection, feel free to send us an email or check out our website at lib.utah.edu forward slash collections forward slash rare books.